Magandang hapon po ulit and a pleasant good afternoon again to everyone. And welcome back to our last day of the first ever webinar series hosted by the Mindoro Biodiversity Conservation Foundation Incorporated or MBCFI in partnership with the Malampaya Joint Venture Partners and with support from the Ukana Philippines. This four-day online seminar focuses on the state of Philippine biodiversity. Now, as one of the richest countries in the world in terms of biodiversity, the Philippines, with its geographic location and archipelagic setting, has a high species diversity and endemicity. But we always see a significant decline in our biodiversity. And this is because of our human doing and activities like poaching, illegal logging, dynamite fishing, eating wildlife, selling wildlife, and many other abuses and disturbances we do to nature. We need to help and protect nature by counteracting and correcting our ways. Thus, this seminar we are having right now will impart more knowledge about the importance of biodiversity. The more people will care and protect them and their natural habitat. The less disturbances and destruction we make to biodiversity, the fewer chances of adverse effects in our ecosystem, thus reducing potential virus outbreak like that of the coronavirus. Today is May 30, and every month of May, we celebrate the month of the ocean with the theme, Para sa Tao, Protected Areas for a Protected Future, an International Day of Biological Diversity with the theme, our solutions are in nature. NBCFI has organized this webinar session. Now, now our four-day online seminar consisted of a series of topics on the current state of Philippine biodiversity on terrestrial, marine, and freshwater, and the threats to biodiversity, focusing on invasive species. Now, in case you have missed our other webisodes and you want to watch it and share it, we have recorded all our past episodes and we have posted it on MBCFI's Facebook page, YouTube, and website. Now, before I introduce our speaker for today, may I remind you to send in your questions in the comment section for the Q&A portion after the talk. Now, for the past three days, we have learned about the status of our country's biodiversity. Today, our topic is the threat to biodiversity focusing on invasive species. Now, who's excited? We have seen from the comment sections, even from the start of this webinar series, that there are a lot of queries, and we hope that our speaker for today can address this. Our special guest today is none other than Mr. Anson Tagtag. Sir Anson finished his bachelor's degree in biology at the University of the Philippines, Baguio, and his master's of art in environmental management at Miriam College, Mr. Tagtag is currently the Chief of the Wildlife Conservation Section of the Biodiversity Management Bureau of the DNR. He coordinates the development and provides technical support in the implementation of national policies, plans, and programs on wildlife conservation, especially on threatened species and in addre addressing invasive alien species under the jurisdiction of the DNR. Friends, let's all west. welcome Mr. Anton Tagtag. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you, MBCFI, for inviting us over to this uh, web seminar to share with you um, uh, insights on and updates on what we are doing on the management of invasive species. Okay. Um, Okay, let me. So, um, my talk will cover. I will talk about uh, um, um, an over the overview on uh, the process invasion, and some um, information on the impacts of EAS in the country, and um, I will proceed on to share with you uh, some of the current um, interventions that uh, the the government is doing to address some of the key invasive species that we have now in this country. Okay, so, right, I'll start with this slide um, on definitions about invasive alien species. And as you can, as you can see, 
uh, we define invasive species uh, as those um, organisms which are introduced to areas outside of their natural habitat, uh, where they become uh, or they uh, uh, become disturbance or their threat to biodiversity. That's the definition from the Convention on Biological Diversity. And um, there are other um, uh, conventional definitions from other organizations which is aligned with the CBD's definition. But as you can see, uh, the, the common um, denominator is uh, that uh, invasive species have impact to the environment, the economy, and uh, uh, health. Right. But at this point, um, it is uh, important to recognize that not all invasive uh, alien species are uh, invasive, right? So invasive species comes in all forms of life. Uh, yes, are, are found in all taxonomic groups, from plants, mammals, viruses, vertebrates, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. And it is important that when we are, uh, we want to address uh, EAS, we should be familiar with how they are introduced. We call it uh, the pathways or routes. So uh, in the case of the Philippines and most uh, uh, introductions in the world, uh, the common pathways of EAS are the following. Accidental or intentional releases from aquaculture, sometimes from laboratories, uh, use, and uh, many of them are, are uh, accidental or intentional releases from pet trade. Some of them are also escaped or released animals uh, or ornamental plants. Uh, travel in transportation also contributes to uh, the introduction of uh, alien uh, organisms being hitchhikers or uh, contaminants. Government and private sector programs and foreign aids, unfortunately, um, when in the past, the, the issue about EAS is not so familiar or we, we don't really have a, a uh, full grasp or understanding about the issue. Um, and most EAS have actually economic uh, uh, use, right? especially for food production, and uh, also intentional introduction for biological control. Um, in the past, especially, especially we have been uh, using um, uh, generalist species as biological control agents, like yung, uh, I think, uh, king toad, no? which I think everyone is most people are familiar with um and also um animals used for games fishing so all of these uh mentioned are the pathways by which uh invasive species are introduced right um let's look at uh, the process or the steps of invasion so um by um Human intervention, uh, species can move from one place to another, uh, and that would result in introduction. Uh, this movement can either be within or between political boundaries, or in the case of archipelagic countries like ours, from one biogeographic island to another. And it could be, as I mentioned, intentional or unintentional. So once a uh, plant or animal uh, enters a new environment or habitat, a country, and survives, well, it, it, it may not, uh, it we can establish uh, its population and uh, probably uh, at the beginning will not spread uh, without human help, uh, such as by horticulture or domestication. And once it is established, it can uh, progress to move on to other areas 
to escape from human care. Uh, they become part of the flora and fauna in its new habitat. And it starts to reproduce without assistance in the young survives and begins to spread. And once that happens, the established and not or naturalized species uh, can get out of hand, competing with native and other established species, impacting on negatively on ecosystems and causing environmental damage. And that's where invasion sets in. And we can now uh, call the exotic species or any species an invasive one. And uh, the, the, the process of uh, the time required to for a species to become uh, invasive could be uh, long. There's sometimes there is what we call a lag time, by which it will take some time for the species to uh, get adapted to its uh, new environment. Um, and then when it's adapted in conditions are um, uh, favorable, then it can um, uh, reproduce lap leech and a population, its population can explode. These are the common characteristics of EAS. Uh, most invasive species are highly prolific. Uh, they're highly competitive and good dispersers. They have high tolerance to a wide range of environmental conditions. They have the ability to live off a wide range of food types also. Uh, it, it thrives in disturbed areas, a widespread distribution in abundant in stated range. And they could also be invasive somewhere else. And uh, um, an EAS, most EAS is an effective invader if they are associated with humans, like they are uh, used for ornament. So essentially, these are the behavioral indicators that, are work that we are looking at. Uh, that we look into if we try to assess the invasiveness of an organism. So if they have this uh, behavioral uh, characteristics, then most likely uh, their potential to become invasive is very high. Now, in terms of impact, um, EAS is regarded as the second biggest threat to biodiversity after habitat. Uh, destruction. In fact, um, the record shows that EAS caused the extinction of 40% of global mammals and other species also. Alter ecosystem structures, as you can see in the, the picture, uh, water lilies, nakikita natin yan, uh, all around us, uh, they interfere with cultural services, uh, tourism, aesthetic. Uh, values of uh, our natural environment. They can be vectors of diseases also. And they have great impact on aquaculture and uh, 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 crops. So it is estimated that the annual global economic losses in the Philippines uh, in 2001 was about 63 trillion. Now, in terms of impacts to um, species, um, this um, slide shows a, uh, an analysis done by the IUCN on the cause of the attribution of uh, EAS to the, the number of threatened species in the world. And um, they find out that um, EAS is the the fourth you know, uh, cause of um, uh, species becoming uh, threatened or at least to extinction. Uh, nationally or the local setting, um, I'd like to share with you some of uh, the findings or some of the uh, uh, key impacts that um, our key EAS is doing with our environment. Um, we have a uh, quite popular invasive uh, small tree in uh, southern Mindanao. We call it the Piper adult, Adontum, or locally they call it Buyo Buyo. And uh, 
This one shows the invasion of Puyo Buyo in Ala Valley watershed, South Cotabato. And as you can see, the dark, uh, uh, bright yellow green color that's the uh, Piper Adonto, it grows uh, very well in, well in um, forest gaps in areas where there is a forest disturbance, the they, uh, they become pioneers. So they inhibit the regeneration or the growth of uh, native species. They also become weeds to perennial crops like uh, banana plantation. And uh, they are able to survive in, or uh, dominate or colonize uh, open areas like pasture land. So it's quite a threat. In the agriculture uh, agriculture sector, the, the impact of ES is um, very apparent. And actually, it's something that uh, we can compute or uh, see in terms of uh, production or money. Unlike in uh, the impact in <laughs> ecosystems, uh, somehow it is hard to quantify. Uh, in the case of uh, the agricultural ecosystem and uh, the fisheries, um, marami ng mga initiatives to address ES because of the very big impact that we have on uh, production. Like, of course, uh, some of you might be very familiar with the clownfish or Chitalia ornata uh, in Laguna Lake. Uh, it was, uh, uh, this fish consumes seven kilograms per, per kilo of its body weight and uh, the loss of 1,030 pesos for every kilogram of live fish. In um, the early days of in, uh, infestation, the, the opportunity loss from live fish infestation is about 12 million uh, per day. So that's how, how big uh, the, the impact was. That's why the government uh, really did invest on um, the control of the live fish. And of course, the, the golden apple snake, uh, which most of us are quite familiar. Uh, ito yung pinaka uh, sikat na iyas na noon pa, ito yata yung nagbukas sa realization natin ng, ng effect ng biological invasion, itong gas. 40% uh, uh, reduction in yield in rice. Uh, another one is the rice black bag. Uh, it's an uh, important ES in uh, uh, rice production. Um, and the estimate is about $55 million uh, potential losses if it's not aborted. Now, um, how, how should we proceed on addressing invasive alien species? Um, recently, uh, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, together with the Department of Agriculture, have uh, collaborated to develop a national invasive strategy and action plan, which now we, the approval is, is uh, on process. And um, it outlines the uh, uh, strategy that we should take to address the invasive alien species problem. So essentially, um, it also aligns with uh, uh, international uh, guidelines uh, coming from the CBD. So uh, as you can see, uh, the stream of action uh, of strategy will start with prevention, early detection, and uh, rapid response and eradication. And if you cannot eradicate, uh, we should do some control in management and uh, do some restoration of uh, areas which were uh, disturbed or destroyed by invasive species. And underlying this uh, uh, work, there are a lot of uh, supporting activities that needs to be done. Like we need to have our policy in, uh, in place in the institutional support, the 
the coordination and leadership and coordination that is needed to mobilize people, uh, research and information management, education and public awareness, uh, training and capacity, and uh, international cooperation. Right. So let's see how um, uh, uh, we should. Uh, how how are we faring with uh, this uh, strategy? So in terms of prevention, there are uh, key strategies, a general strategies of time in the action plan. And essentially, prevention uh, deals with uh, how to stop the entry or introduction of uh, invasive species. And um, strengthening border control, uh, quarantine procedures, uh, having a clear policy on which areas, which invasive species, is, which alien species, I mean, is invasive and which are not, um, those things. So it's up actually prevention. Um, at this point, uh, when we deal with uh, EAS, we have to be, we have to apply um, the, the principle of precautionary approach. So, as you can read in the screen, it says every alien species should be considered guilty of invasiveness until proven elsewhere. So that's why um, in border control, uh, we, if there are applications for, like, say, importation of species for, uh, for use of biological control or uh, for, for commercial propagation, uh, we do take a risk assessment uh, to, to look at any indications of invasiveness before uh, in such uh, application for importation is allowed. Now, in terms of policy, um, we do have a sufficient policy that clearly um, provides uh, guidance on how we should deal with our uh, invasive species. For instance, the, the Wildlife Resource Conservation Act, or Wildlife Act, RA-917, uh, provides that um, any introduction of exotic species should have, should undergo uh, environmental um, assessment in terms of its bioecology and how it can potentially uh, in fact, uh, affect the, the Philippine environment once it, it's released. And it should have uh, it, the approval of the secretary. So in, in, in the case of the DNR, because uh, in terms of management jurisdiction, the DNR takes care of uh, terrestrial species, while the Department of Agriculture, specifically, specifically the BIFAR, uh, has management jurisdiction over aquatic species. So in, uh, in the DNR, we have a National Wildlife Management Committee. This is a multi-agency uh, body which uh, ass assess any um, uh, applications for intentional introduction and recommends to the secretary whether it is safe to import uh, a particular uh, exotic organism. Uh, also, even in trade, uh, in for animals or plants used or applied for uh, for trade uh, transported from uh, other countries, um, we do uh, refuse organisms which are potentially invasive. In protected areas, we have uh, our Republic of Nine Seven Five Eight Six as amended and. It definitely it says that there should be no exotic species introduction in protected areas. Unfortunately, in the past, there had already been introductions. That's why that's the next thing that we need to do once a tree or a plant, uh, which were previously introduced in a protected area and we, we ha had been labeled as EAS, uh, then what should we do now? So, in in um, the Nino Aquino 
parks and wildlife in Quezon City. Uh, if you had been there, it's a uh, urban protected area. Uh, we had started um, cutting down the exotic trees uh, uh, to be replaced with uh, um, native um, uh, tree species. Right? Uh, similarly, with uh, the fishery sector, uh, we have uh, uh, the regulations on the importation of uh, live fish and aquatic products. And of course, the, 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 the quarantine law. Um, we, we are now in coordination with uh, uh, the B Bureau of Plant Industry regarding the enhancement of the, the quarantine procedures such that uh, quarantine procedures should not be limited to uh, looking at that the disease that an organism might carry, but they should also assess if that organism uh, being um, imported or uh, imported is a potential invasive species. So that's one of the uh, improvements in the, the quarantine law that we are work, working on right now. Right. So um, based on our uh, invasive, natural invasive species action plan, we need to come up with a, a list of invasive alien species in the, in the country, sort of uh, what we call black blacklist, no? Na talagang alam natin na ito yung mga plants and animals that are really invasive in that we should not be allowing them uh, to be imported or to be to be patronized you know, in our uh, economy, right? Na sa mga sa plantations or uh, sa sa pet trade. So based on the consultation with our plant conservation committee. Uh, and um, with the uh, Philippine Real, uh, Philippine uh, Fauna Conservation Committee. Um, now we have uh, 37 plants labeled as invasive, uh, 57 fauna, uh, which includes two birds, five mammals, uh, five herbs, and two mollusks, and 43 insects. On the part of Bifar, they also have a they have identified already the they have assessed some of the introduced uh, freshwater fish and um, they labeled uh, eight species as invasive uh, so this uh, on the, in the slide you can see some of the examples of uh, invasive uh, plants affecting uh, forest ecosystems the, the acacia auri uh, the, the Epidipid, uh, the, the Piper Adontum, the um, uh, African Tulip, the Acacia Mangium, uh, the Aroma, uh, Paper Mulberry, and uh, Stanborgia, this is a uh, Evine. Although hindi ko inilagay lahat, no? binigyan ko lang yung, inilagay ko lang dito yung mga uh, key ideas. In the agriculture or built-up um, environment, um, nakasama dyan sa listahan yung mga uh, pests like uh, the coconut leaf beetle, the coconut scale insect, rice duck bug, of course the golden apple, and then also the some shrubs that affects uh, agriculture like uh, hagunoy, uh, mylaminid, lantana, uh, the giant makahia, um, the molos, uh, kasama rin dito yung Afri um, giant African land snail. And uh, for mammals, we have uh, uh, the squirrel, and the variable squirrel, which is now um, in uh, the Metro Manila area. In the aquatic ecosystem, uh, as I mentioned, when there are eight species, uh, freshwater species, ad ad identified 
um, by the BIFAR. This is out of the 60 uh, species which were uh, recorded as introduced. You know, on, on amphibians, uh, we have, uh, as you can see, two species of frogs, the Kalula pulcra, which is relatively new. Ito yung pag nakikinig, pag uh, narinig natin yung parang baka kung tumunog, yung malakas tumunog, lalo na pag uh, nagdidilim na. And of course, yung matagal na na-noisance uh, na frog yung marine toad. And... Uh, Sa mga palayan, uh, nand nandun na rin yung Chinese social turtle. Uh, we have uh, water hyacinth, uh, the water fern, and uh, the, the water lettuce. So, yun pa yung mga invasive species natin sa aquatic. So, we are uh, in the process of uh, preparing the department administrative order uh, that would allow the secretary to declare these species uh, as invasive, uh, oh, oh, on the on those species that is that are under the management jurisdiction of the DNR. Now, um, early detection and rapid response strategy it deals about um, acting um, uh, on newly introduced invasive species. So, here. Um, Kung may darating, halimbawa, uh, example, yung mga piranha. Uh, in the previous years, if you heard, there were some importations of piranha which were not approved by uh, the BIFAR. So, kaagad-agad yung they retrieved. But there are a lot of uh, species or invasive species which are already introduced in the past. And uh, still, uh, we don't know uh, what what they are doing, how they are interacting with the natural environment. So, uh, under this strategy of detection and rapid response, uh, we need to do uh, field surveys, uh, researches uh, to see uh, the, the biology, the ecology of these uh, uh, alien species in the uh, local environment. Uh, and we need to identify uh, these, some of them, if they are ES that it can be uh, eradicated uh, if possible. Right. So uh, as part of this detection process, in 2015, we did have a project on invasive species, uh, which one of the activities were to conduct field surveys in some of our protected areas to detect uh, the invasive uh, potential invasive species that might be already present there so uh, we did have surveys for uh, six protected areas uh, but a national park months manahaw the summer island with mars mount hamigitan in the sibalum and uh, in the table you can see some uh, numbers on how many invasive uh, species that or potentially invasive species that were found in those protected areas. And I think uh, yeah, in the, this slide, uh, uh, I'm showing the ES plants that were found in, in the six protected areas. Okay. Uh, the, the next strategy, if, for instance, a, an alien invasive uh, uh, is able to escape or avoid uh, prevention, and um, uh, eradication and rapid response, then uh, the next step now would be control and management. And at this point, the, the invasive species, species might have already proliferated and eradication is uh, uh, quite impossible. So the, the next option would be to, to control the population up uh, to an acceptable level that it has less impact on the natural environment. Um, and then, uh, so the control in management requires 
uh, really a big investment on the part of the government. Um, it's a serious um, undertaking that it requires, like for instance, the separation of task forces to, to focus uh, on the control program. And um, if it's going to be a long-term activity, so uh, it ha any control of invasive species should be also be integrated in um, monitoring and manage uh, species management programs. Uh, for instance, for protected areas, for any management ecosystem, such that uh, uh, we will be able to prevent uh, any um, further spread of a invasive species already present in the natural environment. So in terms of control and management, there are uh, actually uh, conventional approaches and how to do how to do the control um, first is mechanical uh, or manual removal of an invasive species like what we are doing with uh, water lilies uh, also in the case of large mammals or reptiles mm -hmm. snakes for instance we do trapping so those are mechanical or manual approaches uh, for um, weeds uh, shrubs, mostly uh, uh, chemical and herbicides are uh, the the options. Um, sa atin wala pa tayong ginagawang ganito no, on the ecosystem scale. But in the agricultural setting, farm setting, uh, weeds which are actually invasive plants, uh, chemicals in the herb uh, in the use of herbicides is the the usual approach. Um, biological control also is now being heralded as a an option uh, for invasive ecosystem uh, approach um, in uh, long term uh, control measure for uh, especially for invasive plants and also. Uh, integrated pest management is becoming popular, especially in the agricultural setting. So some examples of biological control, if you are interested. For the plants that I mentioned, like uh, water fern, uh, water lettuce, the, the giant makahia, water lilies, and uh, the chromolina or the hagunoi, um, there are actually um, biological agents that had been released in the country to control these uh, ES plants in, uh, in the past, like um, the Salvinia molista or the uh, the water fern. If, yeah, way back in the 1970s, a weevil, uh, the Sir Tubat Salvini, has already been released in um, uh, Panay Island. Uh, at the time, uh, the water fern is very prolific, problematic species in, um, in, in farm, uh, rice farms. No? And uh, uh, or literature or the articles that was written uh, by uh, DA said that in, in it has been effective in controlling the, the water fern in the island, but um, for some reasons, uh, the uh, uh, the use of the uh, biological control agent in other areas were not pursued. So, uh, well, it has you know uh, gone into oblivion, and uh, until now we are not sure if the Certobagos is still existing in uh, some parts of the country, or if they had been able to spread in other areas, right? Um, okay, so these are the examples of biological control that was introduced in the Philippines, though uh, up to now, um, we don't know what happened to them. The impact uh, is unknown uh, if they were able to establish in the natural environment. But recently in the project of the DNR, um, we did have some survey with the uh, uh, gallfly 
uh, which was introduced uh, several years um, back by the uh, coconut uh, Philippine Coconut Authority. And in Davao, in also in Bohol, we were able to um, confirm that the, after 30 years, they're still there. All right, so this is, I just want to share with you a uh, uh, an example of biological control in Australia, Queensland, using uh, Certobagos to control Salvinia milista. Right. Okay, this is a classic um, approach for fish um, control with the knife fish. Um, it's, it's a big project, it costs millions. And uh, it takes uh, several agencies to, to collaborate, to, to perform the program. So there was the creation of an inter ACT task force, a technical working group uh, from the DA, DNR, uh, the local government, uh, a policy prohibiting the transport of um, knife fish was uh, issued. There was a massive awareness campaign uh, as you can see in the IEC material posted, uh, fish retrieval operations, buying scheme, uh, they buy, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a knife fish 20 pesos per kilo, and then they set up a processing plant for value added um, uh, products you know, like patties, fish ball, uh, sort of like that. But this is only a temporary livelihood. Uh, until the uh, fish is uh, eradicated, uh, is controlled. Uh, they also distribute fishing gear in, uh, in, in with to the farmers. And uh, monitoring was strictly undertaken. So in some point, you were able to show that um, uh, the population or the ratio of the, the catch of knife fish with that of the other fish uh, had uh, dropped from 40% to 15%. Okay, I should do that. Now, um, there's also a very good example from uh, the Department of Agriculture for controlling the coconut uh, leaf beetle and uh, the scale, in, scale insect using integrated uh, pest management, using cultural methods, uh, planting of cover crops, mechanical control, cloning and burning of infected uh, leaves, uh, combined with chemical um, application of chemicals, uh, and then biological control using indigenous um, biological control agents. So we also conducted some researches on uh, what we can uh, use uh, in the, in the local species that can be used for biological control. Uh, more or less, the, the same approach was used for uh, the coconut scale insect. Right. Um, I, I wish also to highlight the, the water hyacinth. Um, although now local governments uh, on their own are feeling the, the, the effects of um, the water lily are already doing their part to, to control the species by mechanical means in PASIG, um, the, the DNR has provided a, uh, a skimmer boat, a, a harvester machine, we, uh, we call it a skimmer boat, to, to uh, harvest um, uh, the water lily more efficiently. And uh, there was also a, a, a livelihood program established to, to, to see how to benefit from raw materials out of the water lilies. Um, also, we have uh, uh, initial uh, activities for response for the Chinese uh, pond turtle that had proliferated in region five and region three. So uh, the DNR has issued a uh, technical bulletin allowing the uh, collection of um, the Chinese pond turtle for direct export trade. And uh, not for local trade. If there is local trade, the the, the species should be should not be light. In 
in Ala Valley also with uh, the Piper Adonkum. There have been uh, initial uh, responses there. Um, originally, the local people do controlled manual cutting in a floating or plowing of uh, the uh, infested lands, and then they, they plant it immediately with uh, 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 some crops you know, so that uh, the, the, the land will be immediately covered. But we did some experiment uh, in the Aldo Valley uh, to see some other options. Uh, we experimented on the use of uh, uh, a combination of approaches uh, of manual and some uh, chemical like that 24D amide and plus restoration. And so uh, at the end of the, uh, the research, the field research, um, it, it was, the research recommend that uh, the, the more effective option would be to do uh, cutting and then the application of a of, uh, chemical, the 4D amine uh, at low concentration to be followed immediately by the So, so this is a an example of what has been done already in the the Ala Valley. So, uh, yung the the restored area uh, or the areas which were cleared with uh, Piper Adong Home will had been um, uh, subjected to uh, restoration using indigenous species. Um, education in public awareness is very much an, a fundamental requirement for managing EAS because uh, managing EAS is essentially a community affair. I mean, every part of the community should, appear, should be aware which plants and animals we should patronize and we should use. And um, in the recent years, somehow, uh, there had been uh, IEC awareness campaigns that we have been doing through the uh, control programs with uh, knife fish and coconut uh, leaf beetle and also with uh, the boyo boyo and also with uh, through the invasive species uh, project of the biodiversity management bureau. So somehow uh, I think that uh, we have steered that the public uh, on, on the issue especially with some of our uh, environmental managers and uh, field uh, officers. Um, they are now more aware uh, and uh, they are reporting uh, species that, or new species that they are seeing in the region. Um, but of course, we need to continue on and uh, do more aggressive campaigns, like especially for, for plants, because plants. So some uh, IEC materials like this would uh, help. Um, some um, approaches for awareness uh, that we can do in the future, probably we, the, which the action plan is recommending, we, we can set up a, uh, an ES week uh, like we do with uh, the Philippine Eagle Week, which is next week or the Tamara month. Uh, to all, you know, to incite awareness, and um, uh, we it can also uh, include EAS issues uh, in as one of the topics that can be shared with students uh, in the their basic courses in the uh, biology, for instance. Uh, the DNR has uh, developed a uh, uh, course outline in uh, some module that we have uh, submitted to the Department of, uh, of Education for their uh, reference in integrating uh, uh, the, the topic in the biology uh, subject. Uh, citizen science, uh, having a more structured program, how citizens can um, uh, report uh, any um, observations on new species coming around the area. Um, probably um, a, a web-based reporting system can, can help. So people would know where to report. Okay, so in conclusion, um, 
I would say that ES management in the Philippines is at, at its infancy uh, with limited information and impact, uh, low level of awareness skill. So we do need to do more robust research on the behavior of existing alien species in our natural ecosystem. We need to explore more uh, sustainable methods other than manual and mechanical approaches or chemical. Uh, integrated pest management is uh, uh, becoming uh, increasingly appreciated or recognized as an effective uh, way of dealing with um, ES. And um, we need to build institutional capacity uh, in terms of resources, uh, knowledge of staff, um, and also equipment, especially at the, the border uh, control. And of course, um, we need to invest on uh, eradication and control uh, uh, programs or projects for priority uh, invasive species that we have already identified. So uh, I think uh, I had my time. That's it. So that ends my uh, presentation. And uh, if you have questions, I will be glad to take them in. Thank you. OK, thank you, Sir Anson, for that very informative presentation about invasive species. Now we open our question and answer forum. So for the first question, Sir Anton, it comes from Anton. Mr. J.R. Kerona. His question is, majority of IAS in the country could have been avoided or regulated through a strategic and standardized process for evaluating risks of these species before being imported into the country. Does the concerned authorities, especially DFAR and DNR, have a competent import risk analysis at present that is aligned with international standards of biosecurity? Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Um, we do have, um, uh, well, for the, the DNR, the, the Biodiversity Management, Biodiversity Management Bureau in particular, who is receiving um, applications for importation. Um, we do use a uh, uh, internationally recommended risk assessment um, process, which we have already translated into a local policy. Um, a local guideline and i'm aware also it's, it's similar with uh, the bureau of fisheries uh, aquatic resources uh, we do have uh, uh, assessment protocols already uh, yeah uh, very much um, agree that it could have been avoided but uh, as you can see the the recognition of the issue sort of came in late i believe Okay. For the next question, Sir Anson, uh, it comes from Mr. Wilhelm Turtle Tan. How come it is not a priority for the Philippine government to control tilapia numbers? Yes, it is an economically important fish, but I feel it is important to lessen their numbers to help protect the native species. Well, I hope I can speak um, uh, more Authority, authoritatively uh, on that issue, um, but unfortunately, it's the uh, it's a the management of the uh, BIFAR. and um, as I mentioned, I I've shown in the presentation is that tilapia is not one of the invasive species that were labeled identified by the expert from um, the BIFAR. So. Um, but then, um, in the in our uh, program, likely like the Balik Sigla Lawa program, that you know, uh, also uh, Bifar is closely coordinating with BMB in terms of you know, ecosystem uh, concerns. That um, exotic species should not be introduced in natural bodies of water. That's that's a clear guidance from the, the Basil uh, uh, program. And this should only be used in man-made uh, uh, setting uh, in aquaculture. 
Okay, thank you for that answer, sir. Last question from Mr. Ariel Roderos. What can normal citizens do to help lessen the introduction and spread of invasive alien species? Yes. Um, we should be careful with what plants and animals that we patronize uh, because, as I mentioned, uh, exotic animals, potentially invasive animals, travel with people. It's actually, it depends on our choices. Now, we, there's already a facility for you to know which organism of plants or animals, ornamental plants, for instance, or, or uh, ornamental uh, fish, which are uh, invasive. So those are the things that we should avoid. Uh, we should also subscribe to uh, quarantine rules and regulations, uh, like if we travel abroad, whether to go outside the country or uh, uh, going in, going back to the country, there are um, regulations that we should declare if we are holding any or bringing in any plants or animals. We should subscribe to that. We should be uh, very much aware on that. Okay. Thank you, Sir Anson. Sir, do you have any last message for our viewers? All right. Thank you very much for uh, listening. And uh, I hope that we, together with the NBCFI, was able to were able to impart with you this important uh, biodiversity concern. And um, uh, as I said, biodiversity conservation, especially addressing EAS, is a community affair. And uh, the if we are able to, to address the issue, it depends on the choices that we are doing on our day-to-day -day life. Thank okay, you. thank you so much, sir. And thank you all for joining NBCFI's four-day webisode. And if you want to view and review all the topics again, just visit our Facebook page. Remember to always protect, conserve, and sustain our environment because Mother Nature can talk, so let's do the talking. But more importantly, let's do the acting of protecting Mother Earth. Now, may I call on the Executive Director of MBCFI, Ma'am Grace Jamante, to award the Certificate of Appreciation to Sir Anson. Thank you, thank you Aya. All right. Uh, um, thank you, Sir Anson, for that wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you for taking time, no, despite the ECQ, diba, sa June 1, uh, GCQ na tayo. But then again, I'm awarding this Certificate of Appreciation to Sir Anson M. Tagtag in grateful acknowledgement of his time and expertise as our online speaker with the topic Threats to Biodiversity, Invasive Species, and Current Practices to Counter Invasive Species during the four-day webinar session held today, 30th of May, 2020. Signed, yours truly, Grace Jamante. So thank you so much, Sir Anson. Again, um, thank you so much. Okay. Again, on behalf of our organization, I would like to thank everyone who stayed with us for the past four days, jam-packed of information, diba? On Philippine terrestrial, marine, freshwater, and from today's session, the invasive species. So thank you to all our speakers, hey, Dr. Leti Afuang, Ms. Des, Maanyo, Sir Hero Labatos, and of course, Sir Anson, salamat. And to our moderator, Aya, thank you so much. Marami pong salamat to the Malampay Joint Venture Partners, Oshana Philippines and GCash for Good for making this webinar session possible. So, many are not yet familiar with uh, or who MBCFI is. And um, do you want to know more about our organization via webinar? Can I get a raise of hand in this comment section? Can I see? Wow. Wow, that, oh, that was, was fast, fast, guys. I can see a lot of hands racing. So, so yeah, yeah. Um, we will keep you posted on any um, future set, uh, webinar that MBCFI will be um, doing. But based on the initial evaluation forms and comments received for the past few days, uh, the public demands more webinar sessions from MBCFI. So, medyo uh, na pressure kami to prepare a new set of uh, interesting topics 
So, yes, definitely we will arrange another set of webinar session with uh, more interesting topics. And uh, before I close this webinar session, let me impart this message that the conservation of biodiversity and protection of its habitat it's not just it's not a just uh, a job of our government no uh, private sectors including local and international ngos and most importantly every individual have a role to play in changing entrenched outlooks and ending adverse effects in our ecosystem and reduce potential virus outbreak para maiwasan na po natin ang tantong uh, virus na COVID-19. So, again, um, everyone has uh, our role to, uh, to do and protect uh, our environment and our biodiversity. Again, uh, on behalf of our team, uh, I'd like to say thank you to Kyle, Maki, and Tan for staying with me for the past four days to make this webinar session possible. Thank you, so Thank you so much, much everyone. Stay safe, Stay safe and see you, see you again soon. Bye. Bye.